1856, Te Kania Takiro, the paramount chief of Ngāti Pro, was offered the mantle of the Māori King movement. In response to this offer, he uttered the words, E hara taku maunga a hikurangi i te maunga haere, he maunga tū tonu. My mountain hikurangi doesn't move, it remains firm and steadfast. This saying reflects the history of hikurangi, which according to Ngāti Pro tradition, was the first part of the North Island to emerge, where Maui pulled it up as a giant fish. According to my people, Maui's canoe became stranded on top of the mountain and is petrified near Hikurangi's summit. These historical narratives consolidate the antiquity of Hikurangi as an original part of the landscape of New Zealand. Unlike other central North Island mountains, Hikurangi doesn't have a history of movement. He didn't fight for Pihanga's affection, he didn't lose Tūruapehu's overwhelming strength, and he didn't sulk off in defeat like Taranaki did to the west, or Putaraki to the north. No, Hikurangi has always been located within the heart of the east coast. Our whole identity as Ngāti Pūrō is tied up with this mountain. Every cultural narrative we have uses Hikurangi as an example of strength, courage, and determination to follow things through to the end. The idea of a Māori king was to unite Māori tribes as a sovereign nation, to counteract the effects of British colonial rule. Those deliberating who should be the king looked at various tribal leaders of the time in order to determine who they would approach to be that person. A number of factors were taken into consideration, but the overwhelming characteristic that would ultimately determine the Māori king was Whakapapa, whose chiefly descent placed them above all others. And so the offer was therefore made to Te Kani Atakiro. Te Kani Atakiro likened himself to Hikurangi. To fulfil the requirements of being the Māori king, he knew that geographically you needed to be located centrally within the North Island. You needed to be easily accessible to the king movement's followers. His location on the east coast meant that he wasn't situated in an ideal part of the country. He also knew that in order to adequately fulfil the duties of office, you needed to be highly mobile and visible. And this was something that didn't sit well with Te Kani Atakiro and his overwhelming need to remain under the shadow of Hikurangi's watchful gaze. He was already a king amongst his people and everything he needed in life could be found on the east coast. Unlike Te Kani a hundred years later, my father lived in a capitalist economy and he couldn't make a living within the confines of the East Coast. My father was born and raised in Horawera, a small rural Māori community on the East Cape. In 1968, when he was 17 years old, he left Horawera to move to Invercargill for seasonal employment at the freezing works. His intention was to return to the East Coast during the off-season, but he never did. Like all great migration love stories, he fell in love. He met my mother instead and began a family with her. Return trips to Horawera to visit my dad's family were regular, but stopped when both my grandparents passed away in the early 1980s. I was three years old. My father grew up with members of our extended family, and he interacted with them on a daily basis. He knew how he was related to each and every one of them. My father lived within the ancestral landscape of our tribe. He learned where the best areas to gather food supplies were located. He used the mountains behind his home as a play area. And he negotiated the foreshore of low tide to navigate his way from one place to the other. My father was educated on the deeds and activities of our ancestors. He was imparted with the morals and the guiding principles of these narratives. And he developed his identity as a person of Ngāti Pūrō descent based on these stories. This was his whakapapa, the framework upon which his knowledge of our people, our place and our time was created. Now, in its simplest form, whakapapa can be defined as the layering of names in order of descent from a particular ancestor. But its application extends beyond simply reciting the names of one's family tree. 
Whakapapa is the foundation upon which the principles of Māori society are constructed. It acts as a framework upon which the fundamentals of Māori knowledge are formed, a framework that binds all things together in both the physical and spiritual worlds so that our knowledge systems and our philosophies are created, developed and transmitted from one generation to the next. Accordingly, Whakapapa commands respect and demands its members to be accountable to the preservation and dissemination of that knowledge. My father's migration southwards stopped this from happening. When he left the East Coast, he left his whakapapa behind and he decided that it didn't have a place in Invercargill, in our home and in our lives. As a result, my sister and I grew up knowing virtually nothing of who we were as Māori, of who we were as Ngāti Pūrō. My last visit to the East Coast had been as a three-year-old and it wasn't until I was 23 that I returned back there. In 2007, my father passed away suddenly of a heart attack. We buried him in Invercargill. When someone is buried away from their tribal area, it's customary to return them back to their marae spiritually as part of the grieving process called kawe mate. When we did my father's kawe mate in 2009, my aunties called a family meeting and told us that a genetic mutation had been found lurking in our whakapapa. Basically, a gene called CDH1 had mutated. When working properly, this gene suppresses tumour growth, but because it doesn't work properly anymore, it actually allows tumours to grow, causing those who carry the mutation more than an 80% chance of getting stomach cancer. But not just any type of stomach cancer. That'd be too easy. This type of cancer doesn't present itself as easily detectable tumours found within the stomach cavity, but is diffuse and happens underneath the stomach lining. This makes it impossible to detect until it has advanced to stage four or five. And by that time, there's no hope for survival. Stomach cancer is the second highest type of cancer-related death worldwide. 90% of stomach cancer cases happen randomly. 10% of stomach cancers show a gene genetic component. And of these genetic cases, only around 1% are said to be cases of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, the type associated with the CDH1 mutation. During the early phase of the genetic research, Whakapapa was used as a tool to help identify who was at risk of being a carrier of the mutated gene. By knowing who had and hadn't been diagnosed with diffuse gastric cancer, a pattern began to emerge, which indicated that this type of cancer could be genetically linked. When I was younger, I was fascinated with a book my father had called The Olive Branches. It contained genealogical charts listing names of people I'd never met, photos of people whose physical features resembled mine, but I didn't know, and stories of ancestors located within a landscape that I couldn't remember ever going to. This was my whakapapa. I knew that I was part of this family, but I didn't know how. In 2009, I underwent genetic testing and was found to be a carrier of the mutated gene. All of a sudden, the information in this book now became real to me. No longer did I think that whakapapa was some abstract concept that existed in some other reality that didn't require my participation or my understanding. Whakapapa finally became real, tangible, and life-saving. There was no drug that I could take that would cure this mutation. There were no screening tests that I could go undertake that were 100% accurate of detecting diffuse gastric cancer. There were no other options available that would prevent hereditary diffuse gastric cancer from occurring other than to have my stomach removed. In June 2010, I had my stomach taken out. Now the pain of surgery is immense. Every little movement hurt, standing sitting, 
lying down, walking, laughing, coughing, sneezing, absolutely everything. And the scar tissue is still sore today. My blood pressure dropped. I didn't know that low blood pressure and hot baths were in a good combination. <laughs> and so I ended up fainting twice in two minutes. And I had to resort to cold showers in the middle of a Dunedin winter. I forgot to eat because the nerve that told me I was hungry wasn't there anymore. When I did eat, I spewed every single time and I hated eating, I hated meal times. I was constantly tired and anemic. And I questioned myself all the time why the hell I would put myself through all of this when I didn't even have cancer in the first place. Five years have passed since my stomach removal and the one thing I've learned is that my mental resolve is far stronger than I ever knew. I am stubborn, I am strong, and I am determined. I am my mountain, I am hikurangi, and my father was wrong to leave our whakapapa behind when he left the East Coast, because not knowing who I am almost killed me. My whakapapa saved my life. Thank you. <laughs>